أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته it's an honor and a privilege to meet with you once again to spend some time reflecting on Surah Al-Hujurat and Alhamdulillah we've reached ayah number 14 now if you recall when we uh, when we were speaking about Surah Al-Hujurat and some of the main themes of the Surah we mentioned that in verses 1 through 5 the discussion revolved around the proper etiquette that must that must be that must be that must be observed the prophet in verses 6 through 12 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shifts the focus to a discussion about how Muslims are to treat one another so verses 1 through 5, the theme is how to treat the Prophet. What is the etiquette when you encounter, when you speak, when you engage with the Prophet? And then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about how we should treat one another, how we foster the spirit of brotherhood and sisterhood. What are the things that we should avoid? What are the things that we should do to truly create a community of believers, of brothers and sisters in faith. Now, verses 13 to 18, which is the last section of the surah, the discussion is about the reality of iman, the reality of faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in ayah number 14, he says, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim, قالت الأعراب آمنا قل لم تؤمنوا ولكن قولوا أسلمنا ولما يدخل الإيمان في قلوبكم وإن تطيعوا الله ورسوله لا يلدكم من أعمالكم شيئا إن الله غفور رحيم Allah says the Bedouins say we believe say O Muhammad you don't believe Rather say we have submitted for belief has not yet entered your hearts. Yet if you obey God and his messenger, he will not diminish any of your deeds. Truly God is exceedingly forgiving and merciful. This particular verse has a story. There is, this verse was revealed uh, for a specific reason. There's an incident that uh, that triggered the revelation of this verse. There was a tribe, a clan, the tribe of Beni Asad, one of the famous tribes in the Arabian Peninsula. They came to the city of Medina. They were living in the outskirts. Many of them were desert dwellers. And that's the meaning of the word Arab. Qalat al-Arab. Arab is different from Arab. Arab means Arabs. Arab are desert dwelling Arabs. They're the nomadics. And you find from the traditions, and even historians mention that because they were living away from the city, many of them were very unrefined, many of them were not very educated. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there was an incident that took place, and Allah takes advantage of this opportunity to make an important distinction between Islam and Iman. So what's the background story? The narrations say that there was a famine that struck certain parts of the Arabian Peninsula. There was a drought, there was, you know, not, there was inadequate food supply. So the tribe of Beni Asad, they, traveled to Medina to meet the Prophet. Now this tribe, they recently became Muslim, and when they arrive in Medina, they meet the Prophet, and they say to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, you know, we, we believed in you, and we did not fight you like the other Arabs. And, you know, we didn't give you a hard time. You invited us to faith, and we believed you. So just as, you, just as we did you a favor, we want you to also, you know, return the favor by providing food and and uh, and these necessary supplies to us. 
And they were claiming not just to be Muslims, they were saying that we are mu'mineen. So they had this, this sort of religious pretension that they saw themselves as the religious elite. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, so these, these individuals are claiming to be mu'mineen, that we are believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah will mention this uh, in, in the upcoming verses. So they're basically saying to the Prophet that, you know, we believed in you, we supported you. Now it's time that you support us. And we want you to support us because we're mu'mineen. You know, so they, they're, the language and the tone is, is kind of a tone of, uh, they're, they're trying to make the Prophet feel obliged. That we obliged you by believing in you without fighting you. So you scratch our back just as we scratched your back. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here decides to reveal this verse, which makes an important distinction between faith between Iman and Islam. The Bedouins, they say, Amanna, we believe, we have Iman. Allah instructs the Prophet to tell them that you don't have faith, you don't have Iman, you have not believed yet. Rather, be more accurate in your assessment of yourself. Say that we have submitted. The word Islam, from a linguistic perspective, it comes from the word Taslim. Taslim means to surrender. Taslim means to surrender. Iman comes from the word Amn, which literally means safety. And it's to it's to have it's to it's to believe in something and to feel to give you that sense of tranquility. It gives you that sense of peace, that sense of safety. So Islam here means entrance into this faith. You know, in the Quran, the word Islam has different meanings. Sometimes Islam refers to the initial stage in your journey to God, that you, you come into the fold of this new religion, as, as in the case of this verse. But you find that there are other verses in the Quran where Islam and Muslim doesn't mean, you know, the, the early stage of your journey to God. So, for example, when Ibrahim and Ismail, when they finish the construction of the Kaaba, what do they say? They make a dua, وَجْعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ لك. Make us Muslims. Make us submissive to you. Now, the Islam that Ibrahim and Ismail are talking about, it's not the Islam that's mentioned in this verse. So sometimes Islam is used in a general sense and it encompasses even faith. But here, there is a distinction between Islam and Iman. Here, Islam means to declare your belief. The declaration of faith. It's not... It's not deeper than that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them that you have not believed yet. Rather, say that we have submitted. We have submitted. Now, from a fiqhi perspective, you know, there are certain jurisprudential implications to someone being Muslim. Now, obviously, we, we don't know who's mu'min and who's not because Allah here clearly indicates that Faith has not yet entered your heart. So iman, faith is related to the heart. It's not, it's not something that's perceptible to us. You know, there might be someone who prays, who fasts, but they're munafiq, they're hypocrites. So faith is something that's related to the heart. Islam is a declaration. It, ta it doesn't take long to be a Muslim. It takes a few seconds. You recite the declaration of faith. Within a few seconds, you become Muslim. Now when someone becomes Muslim, 
we don't have a right to question their sincerity or not. When someone says, La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah, it's not our business to inquire and to investigate whether they are really believers or not. We have to give them the benefit of the doubt. And that's why jurists, they say that if someone recites the shahada, they're Muslim. Unless just one of the fundamentals. Muslim, Muslim. I'm hearing a little bit of echo. Can we turn off the... Uh, so once someone declares the shahada, no one has a right to point the finger and say that you're not really a Muslim. We, we, we don't investigate whether or not this person is sincere or not. We take it at face value. However, if someone rejects one of the fundamentals of Islam, then we can declare that they're not Muslim. So for example, if someone says, La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah, they, declare, they make the declaration of faith, but they say that I don't believe in salah or I don't believe in hajj, where they, if they deny and they reject one of the, the core tenets of the faith, then we can assume that they're not Muslim. So someone who says the Quran is not the word of God, or someone who says that it's not obligatory to pray, where it's not necessary to go to Hajj. Even non-Muslims know that this is a part of Islam. So for someone to reject the obvious fundamentals of Islam, then we can we can determine that that person is outside of the fold of Islam. But other than that, when someone makes the Shahada, we accept them as Muslim. So here Allah says that do not say that you have Iman. Say that you have submitted. Now the question here is, what is Iman? What is faith? There's a, a tradition from the Prophet ﷺ where the Prophet highlights three elements of faith. So Islam is to declare La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah to make that declaration. That is Islam. If someone recites the Shahada, they're Muslim. But what is Iman? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa he says, Al-Imanu Ma'rifatun Bil-Qalb, number one. So we said that there are three elements of Iman. The first is Ma'rifatun Bil-Qalb. The heart has to believe. There has to be conviction in the heart. Ma'rifah has to be in the heart. The heart has to embrace these ideas and these concepts and these realities. So ma'rifatun bil qalb. It's to acknowledge and to know with the heart. Wa qawlun bil lisan. And it's to speak it on the tongue. Wa amalun bil arkan. And it's action on the limbs. So faith, according to the Prophet, engages the heart, the tongue, and the limbs. So the heart has to believe, the tongue has to confess, and the limbs have to act. That is Iman. And this is why we have a tradition from Imam al-Baqir, our fifth Imam, alayhi salatu wassalam, very eloquently. He says, Al-Imanu iqrarun wa amal. Faith, Iman, is acknowledgement, it's attesting to the truth, and it's action. Islam is to recognize the truth, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there is any action. So someone could technically retain their Islam and not do their, obli do their obligations. Now there's a difference between someone who rejects the concept of prayer. That person is not Muslim. But someone who doesn't pray because of laziness, because, you know, for whatever reason, they are still Muslim. 
but they're fasik, but they're sinners, they're corrupt. And this is the difference between us and takfiris. Takfiris, this takfiri ideology, anyone who doesn't practice Islam, at least from their perspective, is not just a sinner. They have left, they have departed the religion of Islam. So many of these takfiris, if they find someone who doesn't pray or doesn't fast, they label them as kuffar. Whereas us in the school of Ahlul Bayt and even the majority of Muslims hold, hold this belief that a non-practicing Muslim is still a Muslim. They are sinful Muslims. They only, they only depart the fold of Islam if they reject some of the core fundamentals of Islam as I said if they say the Quran is not the word of God or Mecca is not important and you know there's no fasting in the month of Ramadan if they reject the the rituals and these these uh, these practices that's when they they're considered non-muslim so al-islam that someone retains their Islam even if they have nothing to show for even if they don't practice they're still considered Muslim by virtue of that verbal confession that there is no God but God and Muhammad is, is, is his messenger. In another hadith from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, our sixth Imam, he says, Inna al-imana ma waqara fil qulub. That Iman is a conviction. It's the conviction of the hearts. والإسلام ما عليه المناكح والمواريث وحقول الدماء. Islam is what makes it permissible for one for us to marry each other, and for us to inherit from one another. Muslims are not allowed to marry kuffar. Muslim, you know, a, a kafir cannot inherit from a Muslim. So Islam. Even the, the, the superficial Islam, it, it allows us to marry, to inherit, and so on and so forth. Now, in the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in verse number 15, He goes into more detail. So go, if I go back to the uh, ayah number 14 before we continue. So the, la the last part of the verse, I, I forgot to mention the last part of the verse. So the beginning of the verse, these members of Bani Asa, they claim to have faith. Allah says, no, you don't have faith. You don't have iman. You, are, you have submitted. Because faith has yet to enter your hearts. But if you obey God and His Messenger, your deeds will not be diminished if you believe in God, if you obey God and His Messenger. Your deeds will not be diminished. Some, some Muslims, when they joined Islam, many of them may have had this question that, you know, we did, we've committed many sins in the past. Are we pardoned for those sins that we committed in the past? We have narrations that say, Al Islam ma qabla, that your sins are forgiven. The sins that you committed before Islam are forgiven. But the question is, how about the good deeds? The good deeds that someone did before they became Muslim, do those have any value? So Allah says, Wa in Allah wa rasulahu la min a'malikum that if you believe in God and His Messenger, He will not diminish any of your deeds, even the deeds, the good deeds that you performed before you became Muslim or before you became religious. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not diminish any of your deeds. They're all counted. Why? In Allah ghafoorur rahim. Allah is exceedingly forgiving. And here, I think we've mentioned this in our previous sessions, ghafoor means that Allah forgives no matter how great the sin is. Ghaffar is the one who 
forgives irrespective of quantity. Ghafur is the one who forgives irrespective of the magnitude of the sin. No matter how great the sin is, Allah is forgiving. And He's Rahim, He's merciful. In verse number 15, again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expounds on this concept of Iman. Only they are believers who believe in God and His Messenger. Then do not doubt and who strive with their wealth and their selves in the way of God. It is they who are the truthful. Innama, the word innama is adatu hasr. It's a linguistic device that conveys exclusivity, meaning that the believers are only these people who have these qualities can call themselves believers. They believe in God, right? Meaning they believe in God in their hearts. It's not just some, it's not just on their tongues. They believe in the messenger. And, and what it means to believe in God is to know that He is the source of peace. He is the source of happiness. That when you believe in the messenger of God, that you believe He is the greatest spiritual physician, that with Him is true guidance. So believing in God and His Messenger. And then Allah says, ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُ That you have to maintain this faith, that you don't doubt. Now, the Qur'an is very precise in the words that it uses. In the Arabic language, there was the word shek. The word shek means doubt. And then you have the word irtiab. Irtiyab also means doubt. But there's a difference between shak and irtiyab. Shak is rational doubt. And this type of doubt is healthy. Because this type of doubt is a necessary step towards understanding. If you never have doubt, how are you ever going to increase your knowledge? How are you going to move closer towards understanding certain realities. So shek doesn't have negative connotations. Allah doesn't condemn people who have shek because shek is reasonable doubt. It's rational doubt. It's doubt that is rooted in logic, in reason. But irtiyab is unnecessary doubt. It's doubt that is rooted in rebelliousness it's doubting something because you don't want to believe it you know so for example imagine you see someone who's begging now it's possible for you to have reasonable doubts that you doubt whether they're actually in need or not that doubt is called check you're not sure if this person is actually in need or not and then you have another person who's stingy. He doesn't want to give. And his doubt is not coming from a place of sincerity. He's doubting because he wants to justify his stinginess. So sometimes you doubt as a justification for your ways. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says those who believe, they don't entertain irrational doubts. Right? Here Allah is highlighting the steadfast nature of faith. You know, as I, as I mentioned, brothers and sisters, becoming Muslim only takes a few seconds. But being mu'min, being a believer, is something that could take years and it could take even a lifetime. Why? Because it requires a constant struggle. Wajahidu, what type of struggle? 
You have to struggle with the things that are most dear to you. They struggle with their wealth. You know, we're we're obsessed with our money. Our wealth, for some of us, it's the most dear thing to us. That they strive with their wealth and their selves. They're willing to sacrifice their money and even their lives. And you can only sacrifice these things if you have certainty. And that's why Allah says the, the, the believers are those who believe in God and His Messenger and they don't doubt. Because if you have doubt, you, would, you'll ne you will never be willing to sacrifice if you have doubt. You have to have certainty to be able to make those types of sacrifices, those types of sacrifices. The people who fought alongside Imam Hussein alayhi salam, do you think they had any raib, any irtiyab? They didn't. You can't make a supreme sacrifice if you have this these irrational doubts. Fi sabilillah. See, struggling is not enough. You know, just because you give and you spend time, it, it's a very specific type of type of struggle. It has to be struggling and striving fi sabilillah. For the sake of God, not for the sake of popularity, not for the sake of recognition. You know, someone theoretically could be working for the community day and night. They could be donating to many noble causes. They could be spending tens of thousands of dollars and thousands of hours doing Islamic work. But if it's not sincerely for the sake of Allah, it's not going to bring you close to God. That's not the recipe for faith. So the struggle, the striving has to be done with the proper intentions. And therefore, it's, a, it's important for us brothers and sisters that when we contribute, when we give money, when we give our time, make sure that you're doing it with the right intentions. Otherwise, it's a waste. It's a waste of time and it's a waste of money. So faith is something that requires an ongoing struggle. These are the people who are truthful. Now, sadiq, what is the meaning of sadiq? Sadiq, does it mean someone who tells the truth? No, because even a liar and sometimes tell the truth. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He, in Surah Al-Munafiqoon, Surah 63, verse 1, Allah mentions the hypocrites. The hypocrites also spoke truth. Allah says in verse number 1, إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُنَافِقُونَ O Muhammad, when the hypocrites come to you, قَالُوا نَشْهَدُ إِنَّكَ لَرَسُولُ اللَّهِ we bear witness, undoubtedly, you are the messenger of God. That's a true statement. But are they truthful? Allah says, Wallahu yahlamu inna kala rasulu. God knows that you are his messenger. Wallahu yashhadu inna al munafiqina la kadibu. And God bears witness that the hypocrites are liars, even though they tell the truth. Even though they're speaking the truth, they're not truthful. They're, they're liars. Because the Quranic conception of a truthful person is not just someone who tells the truth with his tongue. The Quranic conception of a truthful person, someone who is sadiq, is someone whose words, whose actions, whose wealth, everything about this person is at the service of the truth. They love the truth. Someone who is sadiq, speaks the truth, defends the truth, is at the service of the truth, and loves the truth. They love the truth. You know, sometimes a mu'min may have to tell a lie to save themselves. 
or to stop a fitna in the community. So for example, you know, someone comes up to you and they say that, is it true that so-and-so backbited against me? No, as, as a mu'min, you can't say that, oh, I have to tell him. I have to tell him the truth. No, no, no. This is an instance where you're, where you're allowed to lie. In fact, you are obligated to lie, to say, no, on the contrary. They say wonderful things about you. Now, this is your religious obligation to put out the fires. However, when a believer, you know, if, 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 for example, someone pulls a gun to your head and says, are you Muslim or are you a, are you a non-Muslim? And you know that if you say Muslim, that if, if you said that you're Muslim, you're going to get shot. So you say that I'm not Muslim. Someone who is Sadiq will lie to save themselves, but it will be very bitter for them. They won't enjoy it because they don't like to be dishonest. They do it out of necessity sometimes. You know, it's the same, it's the same thing with someone who always eats halal food and they find themselves in the middle of nowhere and they only have haram to eat. Do you think they're going to enjoy that haram food? They're not. Because everything about them loves the halal and therefore they're only going to take what they need to survive. So, so uh, someone who is sadiq, according to the Quran, is not just someone who speaks the truth. It's someone who is committed to the truth, who has committed his life, his wealth, his time, everything to uphold the truth because they love the truth. <inaudible> these are the truthful ones. So if you are, if you are true to your, these are the people who. Allah calls as sadiqun It's much deeper than just speaking the truth. It's being, living a life whereby you are at the service of the truth. Ayah number 16, Allah says, قُلْ أَتُعَلِّمُونَ اللَّهَ بِدِينِكُمْ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ Wallahu bi kulli shay'in alim. Say, do you teach God about your religion when God knows what is in the heavens and what is in the earth and God is the knower of all things? You know, some of the companions of the Prophet, they would come to the Prophet and say that, Ya Rasulullah, we have iman. We believe. Tell God that we believe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that. Are you trying to teach God? You're trying to inform God who has faith in their hearts? Allah is the one who knows what is in the heavens and what is in the earth. You don't need to tell God or tell the messenger that you have faith. If you have faith, he knows. You don't need to prove it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. Wallahu bi kulli shay'in alim, and God is the knower of all things. This verse highlights the knowledge of God. He knows what's in the heavens, he knows what is in the earth, and he's the knower of all things. You know, brothers and sisters, if you look at the Quran, the most emphasized attribute of God in the Quran is his mercy rahmah, without a doubt but do you know what the second most mentioned attribute of God in the Quran is after his mercy the most mentioned name the most mentioned attribute of Allah is his knowledge his ilm so the two most emphasized attributes of God in the Quran is his rahma and his knowledge if you go to surah luqman verse number 16 and brothers and sisters this is important for us to understand if the most emphasized attributes of God in the Quran if they are his mercy and his knowledge don't you think that when we teach our children about God, 
the way that we should present God to them, the things that we should emphasize most to our children is that Allah is merciful and He's all knowing. Mercy and knowledge are the two most emphasized. Many of us, we emphasize that He's Shadidul Aqab, that He is severe in His punishment. Yes, Allah is severe in His punishment. No one is denying that. But just as the Quran emphasizes rahmah and ilm more than any other divine attribute in Islamic education, when we teach people about God, mercy and knowledge needs to be the most emphasized because this is the Quranic way. Luqman, he is teaching his son about God. What does he say? In verse number 16, Ya Bunayya, innaha. إن تكن مثقال حبة من خردل فتكون في صخرة أو في السماوات أو في الأرض يأتي بها الله إن الله لطيف خبير. Oh my son, oh my beloved son. If it is, he's speaking about your actions, even if it's something as significant as a mustard seed, and it's hidden in a rock, or in the heavens, or in the earth, God will bring it out. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware. He knows about all of the subtleties. So Luqman, when he teaches his son about God, there's a conversation about the omniscience of God, that God is, is all-knowing. And this is part of our tarbiyah, to know that Allah is aware of our actions. When we're alone, He sees us. He knows what is deep within our hearts. So, rahma and knowledge, mercy and knowledge, even the angels. You know, if you go to Surah Ghafir, ayah number seven, Allah speaks to us about the, the angels. The angels that carry the throne of God. And the angels that surround it. So we're talking about the elite angels. You said bihamdi rabbihim. The main activity of malaika is tasbih, glorification and praise of God. bihi, and they believe in Him. and malaika they ask God to forgive the believers. They do istighfar for mu'minin. And then what do they say? رَبَّنَا وَسِعْتَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ رَحْمَةً وَعِلْمًا They say, our Lord, you have encompassed everything with your mercy and your knowledge. Your mercy and your knowledge. These are the two most emphasized Attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran. Verse number 17. Ya munnoon alayka an aslamu. Kulla ta munnu alayya islamakum. Belillahu ya munnu alaykum an hadakum lil iman. In kuntum sadiqeen. Allah says they, meaning in this context it's Bani Asad, they count it as a favor to you that they have submitted. Do not count your submission as a favor to me. Rather, God confers a favor upon you in that he has guided you to believe if you are truthful. As I mentioned, this tribe, Bani Asad, they come to Medina, it's a famine, and they, they're requesting financial assistance from the Prophet. And they're basically telling the Prophet that, you know, we didn't give you a hard time. We believed in you. We did you a favor by joining you. You know, we strengthened Islam because our entire tribe became Muslim. So they're, they're trying to make the Prophet feel obliged. That, you know, we did a favor. We joined you. We strengthened your numbers by becoming Muslim. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is telling the Prophet. And this shows you the Prophet, even when Muslims, they would talk like this to the Prophet, 
the Prophet was too embarrassed to to call them out. But here Allah is telling telling the Prophet that don't let them talk to you like that. Do not do not consider that a favor upon me that you became Muslim. Now the word men, minna. Originally in classical Arabic, it refers to something that weighs a lot. Now the word minna in Arabic, it refers to a weighty blessing, a heavy blessing. You know that that's why and and that's different from the word ni'ma so ni'ma means blessing minna means a very weighty blessing for example allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he speaks about the prophet about sending the prophet to us as a guide he says laqad manna allahu ala al-mu'minin idh ba'atha feehim rasulan min anfusihim that allah has conferred a great favor upon the believers by appointing from among them a messenger so rasulullah is not just a ni'mah he's a minna he's a great weighty blessing upon us so it's a ni'mah with thaqila but when people remind you of the favors that they did upon you it, it has negative connotations it's negative to do someone a favor and remind them of it. This is why in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 264, Allah says, Ya amanu, la tubtilu sadaqatikum bil manni wal adha. O you who believe, do not nullify your charitable offerings by counting it as a favor upon those who you give charity to. Don't, when you give, when you help, don't hang favors over people's heads. This completely, you know, makes your actions null and void. It has no value. In fact, it, it becomes a sin to, to do that. So here, these individuals from the tribe of Bani Asad, they're counting their conversion to Islam as a favor to the Prophet. They're acting as though they did you a favor by becoming Muslim. You know, declaring Islam is comparable to registering at a university. Do you, you know, the, you don't, the, you, you're not doing a, a favor to the university when you register. The university is doing you a favor because it's offering you an opportunity to become educated. Islam is the same way. When you declare your Islam, you're basically enrolling in the university of God. So who who owes the favor? Who did, who did who a favor? Did you do a favor or did Allah do you a favor? That he has afforded you an opportunity to grow, to become more human, to become a person of virtue. Don't count your submission as a favor to me. Rather, بَلِلَّهُ يَمُنُّ عَلَيْكُمْ and adakum lil iman that God Allah has conferred a favor upon you and that he has guided you you know brothers and sisters we thank Allah azza wa jal for material blessings and we should we should be grateful but how many of us on a regular basis how many of us thank Allah for guiding us how many of us thank Allah that in the month of Muharram when other people are going to the casinos and they're getting drunk and they're living these aimless lives, we go and we listen to the majalis of Imam al Isn't This is a great ni'mah upon us. That we have to thank Allah that we have role models like the Ahlul Bayt, that our sisters have personalities like Sayyidah Zainab, Fatima to Zahra. We have the Ahlul Bayt, alayhim as -salam. We have Quran. We, we live comfortable lives, materialistically comfortable lives, and we live rich spiritual lives. Allah has allowed us to enjoy the dunya and the akhirah, that we, we, we live, we have a deeper sense of satisfaction because of this guidance. 
and hadakum lil iman. Allah wishes to guide you towards faith, towards iman. Islam is just the, the beginning. Allah wants to guide you towards faith, and faith has many levels. In kuntum sadiqeen. If you are truthful in your claim that you are a believer, then you should be grateful to Allah for guiding you. So we have to incorporate this into our dua. Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana lihadha wa ma kunna linahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah. We should recite this in the qunut that we should express our gratitude to Allah for his hidayah, specifically for guiding us to Ahlul Bayt. There are many Muslims, believe me, they they go to the mosques every week and they never hear Qala al-Imam al-Sadiq, Qala al-Qala al-Baqir, Qala Amir al-Mu'mineen, Qala Fatima al-Zahra. They don't hear that. So if we are people of Iman, first and foremost, before we even thank Allah for the food and for our health, we have to thank Him for Hidayah, for guidance, for the wilaya of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the final verse, and inshallah, will conclude the reflection on Surah Al-Hujurat. Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَعْلَمُ غَيْبَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاللَّهُ بَصِيرٌ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ Truly God knows the unseen of the heavens and the earth, and God sees whatever you do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions in, uh, in verse number 16 that He knows what is in the heavens and what is in the earth. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so Allah knows what is in the heavens and what is in the earth. Now, you may think that Allah knows what is apparent in the heavens and in the earth. But here Allah reminds us of how deep His knowledge actually is. He doesn't only know what is in the heavens and what is in the earth. He knows غيب السماوات والأرض. He knows the unseen of the heavens and the earth. What is visible on earth what is visible in the heavens is only a part of what exists. Alamul Mulk is just the tip of the iceberg. So Allah is also aware of the things that are hidden in the heavens, that are hidden in the earth. Wallahu basirun bima ta'amalun. And God and the Lord who knows the ghayb of the heavens and the earth. Surely he knows what you do. And Allah Azza wa Jal, believe me brothers and sisters, he knows us better than we even know ourselves. You know, some of us, we think we think to ourselves that yes, you know, we're mu'mineen. But maybe if Allah puts us in a certain circumstance, in a certain situation, we may discover something about ourselves that we didn't even know. Allah is closer to our hearts than we are to our own hearts. Yahulu bain al mar'i wa qalbi. Allah is between man and his heart. Allah knows. He knows the inner layers of our hearts. And therefore, this should remind us that we, we are always under his watchful eye. Allah is basir. He sees, but of course, not with the aid of eyes. His knowledge of what is visible is similar to our knowledge of things that we see, but at a much deeper level, that Allah is ever watchful, He's ever aware. And with that, brothers and sisters, uh, that concludes our reflection on Surah Al-Hujurat. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept the little that we offer. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept these discussions as a means of attaining nearness to him. Uh, I thank you, brothers and sisters, for spending uh, your valuable time, you know, uh, listening and sharing your questions and your comments. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept these gatherings as a form of ibadah, as a form of worship. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين. If we have any questions or comments, we can uh, we can take them إن شاء الله. So the the word Arab and Arab they they share the same roots. عرب يعرب So عرب one of the reasons why, so Arab means to make something clear, make something evident. And uh, what's the relationship between Arab and Arab? Off the top of my head, I would have to consult with, uh, you know, uh, the Arabic uh, dictionaries to look at and see if there's a relationship. But uh, linguistically, the word Arab it, so it comes from the word Araba, which means to make something clear, to make something uh, evident. And it could be that, you know, because many of the uh, of the Arabs, they were living in the uh, in the deserts, and it's, you know, it, it would be very easy to, uh, to see them because uh, you don't have, you know, so because they're in the open desert, it could, it could be that they were easily seen. Their presence was very uh, evident, but I I do recall that Araba uh, means to make something uh, clear or evident. But the relationship between the two, I don't, I'm not sure. So the the two sermons for the Friday prayer, the reason why there are two, is because those two sermons are meant to represent a rak'ah. So Salatul Jumu'ah. Is two rak'ah, and those two sermons are meant to count as two rak'ah, and therefore it takes the place of Salat al dhuhr for example. So Salat al dhuhr is four rak'ah. On Friday, we offer Salat al Jumu'ah, which is two rak'ah, and the other uh, the other two rak'ah are are basically represented by those two two sermons. Now, as for the question of why does the uh, the imam have to hold a uh, a staff? It's not it's not required. It's recommended, but I'm not uh, I'm not sure why it's recommended. I would have to uh, look at the ahadith. I'm not sure if the Ahlul Bayt have mentioned anything specifically, and the same goes with the uh, the uh, the sitting uh, between the uh, the two uh, two sermons. I believe that uh, uh, the book Alal uh, al by Sheikh al Sadduq, I think there's a section on uh, on this topic that I'll uh, I'll check just to make sure if, to see if the Imams have mentioned anything regarding the staff and uh, the sitting uh, af sitting between the two uh, the two sermons. So the book Alal al by Sheikh al Sadduq is a good resource i believe it's also been translated where al sharia basically means the uh the reason the philosophy behind a lot of these uh, islamic rulings and these are traditions from the uh the ahlul bayt about that <laughs>